Hello, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cameron Urban, and today I'm going to be talking about the unsteady vortex lattice method, also known as the UVLM. And I will also be going into specifics about how it is applicable to the study of flapping wing flight. So I'll start off with some personal background. About a year ago, I stumbled upon an article about the flight of pterosaurs, which are these massive flying reptiles that lived alongside the dinosaurs. The idea of what were essentially real life dragons piqued my interest, and before long I fell head over heels in love with the science of flapping wing flight. I spent about a year teaching myself a foundation in unsteady aerodynamics, and then began research under Dr. Agarwal, who runs WashU's aerodynamics lab. I also recently began a collaboration with Dr. Kenneth Brower, the head of a lab at Brown University that runs experimental studies on bat flight. So it's clear that there is a lot of academic interest in flapping wing flight. This is because animals are better at flying than any human invention. This might sound like a controversial statement, so let me qualify it. While animals might not be able to fly as fast as a jet or carry as much weight as a cargo plane, they are able to fly with higher maneuverability, adaptability, and grace than any human contraption. Suffice to say, we have a lot to learn from the creatures that have been flying for hundreds of millions of years before the Wright brothers first took off in Kitty Hawk. So say you want to begin uncovering some of these secrets of animal flight. Well, you have three main options. The first is to run a physical experiment. This method produces the results that are as close to truth as possible. However, there is a lot of controversy in the best way to run these experiments for flapping wings. Additionally, they require hundreds of hours of engineering time, designing a robot that can flap, and also access to extremely expensive equipment like a wind tunnel. The second and most common option is to use a high fidelity simulation tool. These methods are commonly known as CFD, which stands for computational fluid dynamics. This term technically encompasses all types of numerical simulations, but it is usually reserved for the types of simulations that can get you within a few percent of the correct result, but do so incredibly slowly. For flapping wing simulations, this method can take days, if not weeks, to finish on a high-end computer. The final option is to run a low-fidelity simulation. There are a range of different algorithms that this term applies to, including the UVLM. These methods may only produce results that are around 10 to 20% accurate, but they can run in minutes on any laptop. All three of these methods have their uses. However, I'm going to focus on the low fidelity simulation methods, specifically the UVLM, because it is the most underutilized, especially in engineering applications. For example, when designing a flapping wing robot, hundreds of configurations may need to be analyzed to find a solution that works. This simply cannot be done with CFD or using experimental techniques. So this choice of, simula of solution is made on an underlying assumption, and that is that the UVLM can accurately simulate flapping wings in the first place. This assumption is proven to be correct by a paper that came out of Penn State in 2004. The authors wrote their own UVLM and then compared its results to experimental and theoretical data for simple flapping wing motions. On the left are the results for a plunging wing. This is the classic flapping up and down motion that we think of when we see birds or bats fly. On the right, we have the results for a pitching wing. This motion occurs when a bird pronates or supinates its arm muscles, tilting its wing up or down. As you can see, the UVLM results show good experiment with both the experimental and theoretical data sets in both cases. So to explain the UVLM, I first need to describe the importance of vorticity. A vortex is simply a collection of swirling fluid. We experience, we experience vortices in everyday life. For example, the water draining out of a bathtub is a vortex. Vorticity is also one way aerodynamicists understand how airplanes generate lift and drag. So you can think of the vortices that an airplane makes as a giant horseshoe. The front of the horseshoe goes across the entire wing, and the legs of the horseshoe, one of which you can see here, 
extend backward from the tips of the wings to infinity. These are called vortex segments as they create a the, oh these vortex segments as they are called create a fluid velocity at every other point around them just like how you would still feel the breeze from a tornado when standing far away from it. This velocity can be calculated using the Biot-Savart law shown here. And the forces that these vortices exert on the wing can be calculated using a formula known as the Kudachikowski theorem. So the next step in understanding UVLM is to understand its cousin, the VLM. The VLM, also known as the vortex lattice method, is used to analyze steady air dynamics, like those experienced by a normal airplane cruising along with not much happening to it. Before, I said that we could think of the vortex created by an airplane as three line segments in a giant horseshoe. It turns out we can get even more accurate results if we divide the wing up into a bunch of little horseshoes and then add up each of their contributions. The main reason why we can't use this vortex lattice method to analyze unsteady aerodynamics is that it has a stationary wake represented by the legs of the horseshoes. As you can imagine, when something is flapping, the wake changes while it flaps. The changing wake then affects the aerodynamics experienced by the wing itself. To simulate this, we need to use a time-stepping approach, which is just a fancy term for a big simulation that runs a, runs a bunch of small simulations that are snapshots in time as the system changes. First, the plane is again broken up into a bunch of small vortices. However, now these vortices are rings, not horseshoes. After each time step, the wing moves a small amount and the vortices at the trailing edge of the wing are shed into the wake. The vortices on the wing are replenished and then the cycle repeats itself. This can produce results such as this. So this is a simulation that I ran on my own open source UVLM Terra software. The white grid represents the vortices shed off the wing and into the wake, and the colors on the wing indicate the pressures experienced by each panel. So the wake begins to look sort of chaotic towards the end of the simulation. This is actually representative of how a wake begins to break down farther away from a wing. So there is a famous quote from the statistician George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So while low fidelity tools can provide insight into natural phenomena, the flight animals have evolved through natural selection is so complex that it is impossible to simulate every detail. This is true regardless of the method of analysis used. In that vein, I will finish with a beautiful video from National Geographic on the flight of hummingbirds. See if you can spot some of the vortices I mentioned shedding off the hummingbird's wings.
So here are the credits for the images that I used, and thank you so much for your time.